science is always evolving, right? It's always evolving. And those who try to weaponize uncertainty try to create this false dichotomy that you were wrong in the past, so you're wrong now. On the contrary, changing your mind based on the science is a badge of honor. Hi, I'm Taylor Owen, and this is Big Tech. If you're just quiet enough, you might have heard it. Mark Zuckerberg breathing a sigh of relief, because this time, it's not Facebook or Meta in the crossfire. Instead, it's Spotify, the latest tech giant under pressure to police its content. The controversy revolves around whether Spotify should moderate or even remove their star podcaster Joe Rogan who in 2020, they paid over $100 million to publish exclusively on their platform. The concerns about Rogan have since evolved to include misogynistic and racist comments that he made, but they started with claims of his podcast dangerously spreading inaccuracies about COVID. And that's one of the things that I find very bizarre about the tribal aspect of this is that people want me to get vaccinated. And like my friends who've been vaccinated want me to join the team. And I'm like, I've gone through the virus. I have immunity. I also have antibodies. I just checked them last week. Like, I could show you the test. But the point being is it doesn't make any sense for me to get vaccinated, but they want me to join. It's it's worse than that. It puts you at higher risk. Yes. Okay, they're asking you to take more risk for your health in order to join their club. That's what it is. The reality is that COVID-19 is the first pandemic in history that we're experiencing alongside new technologies that give us massive and quick reach. Rogan's audience alone is in the millions. It's a chaotic information context, what some are calling an infodemic. And Tim Caulfield is trying to cut through the noise. He's the Canada Research Chair in Health, Law, and Policy at the University of Alberta. He has written best-selling books, including Is Gwyneth Paltrow Wrong About Everything? When Celebrity Culture and Science Clash. He has a Netflix show on medical myths, and he's fighting misinformation with his campaign, hashtag science up first. In a moment when it feels like we should be celebrating science, we're instead grappling with how to handle health misinformation and a mistrust of COVID measures, vaccines, and institutions in general. It's a moment where the uncertainty of science is being weaponized, where public health measures have been politicized, and where getting science communication right is critically important. Here's my conversation with Tim Caulfield. I want to talk to you more broadly about the moment we find ourselves in right now. But first, I thought we should start with the Joe Rogan controversy. Because I I do find it kind of fascinating. I study the media and journalism, and the fact that this guy has the profile and just massive audience that he does, um, frankly, is just remarkable. And yet he's now found himself at the center of all these debates right now. And I wonder what you make of the fact that he's now at the center of the health misinformation discussion that you're so central to. He is an absolutely fascinating phenomenon because it's not like his format is tremendously unique. Um, And it's not like he is a fantastically compelling interviewer. I I get that people really like his style. I totally get it. And, you know, he has this, this very conversational tone that you feel like you are hanging out with him in your basement. But why I think his strategy has been so damaging and unfortunately so powerful is he's mastered the hey i'm just asking questions strategy right he is the king of that strategy so that makes him seem kind of benign and almost noble right in his quest for for answers but what of course he really is doing is enabling misinformation actually what he's doing is championing misinformation right because he doesn't really hold these people's feet to the fire right he 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 sounds like he's amazed and wow is that ever interesting he's so 
I, I do think it's fascinating that, that, that this guy has become the focus of our freedom of expression debate and and our debate about how we we battle misinformation. So he is under fire, rightly, for a whole host of things that go beyond medical misinformation or COVID misinformation. Um, but you know COVID misinformation better than anybody. What does he do that's so damaging to this public discourse we're in the middle of? Yeah, I think it's really important to, you know, just to, to pause and highlight the degree to which what he's championing is misinformation. Okay, so let's walk walk us through that. Yeah, because if, if we just focus on the Malone, Robert mm. Malone and Peter McCullough interviews, okay? okay. And there's he's done other stuff, okay? He's done other stuff. But let's just focus on on those two for now. The stuff that's being pushed is on the fringe, right? We're not talking about you know, the science, the messy science around how and when we should open up schools or the messy science around the degree to which you get immunity from Omicron and how long lasting that that immunity is. We're talking about ivermectin, no evidence to support it. We're talking about this, the idea that the, the number of deaths around uh, COVID have been exaggerated for political reasons. No evidence to support that. On the contrary, most scientists think they've been undercounted. We're talking uh, about uh, misrepresenting the risks associated with with uh, the vaccines, like the idea that it causes infertility. We're talking about stuff that is clearly misinformation. And I think that's important to highlight because that goes to really what people like myself are calling for, which is responsible programming, right? Y- you can have these people on, but at a minimum, you've got to highlight the degree to which what they're pushing is misinformation. And he doesn't do any of that, right? Or even is fringe. He doesn't even qualify it as being outside of the mainstream. It's- no, he he push, he helps them push the idea that in fact this that you're being silenced and this is, you know, this is a mess a message that needs to get out there. And and of course there's that irony that everyone highlights, you know, the, uh, the fact that these people are sitting on Joe Rogan talking to what you know, tens of millions of followers and they're silenced, right? That irony aside, um, it is really, really unfortunate that he's he's sort of empowering th- these bits of misinformation. And I think it's also important to recognize that we know from research, and we're involved in this work ourselves, it does harm. You know, this it does real, real harm. This is just not like speculation. It's unfortunate this narrative is out there. These This kind of misinformation does real harm. So Spotify's reacted by taking down some conversations of his, but none fr- really in the COVID misinformation space. Um, so they're clearly taking this as like within the bounds of their terms of service. And he's responded um, by saying he's going to try better and to create more balance in his guess. Um, I've heard you say that you think actually that's a positive step. What do you mean by that? Yeah, may- maybe my my tolerance for good news now is so low. <laughs> going to say, so where's, your, where's your bar here? <laughs> <laughs> my bar. I, look, I, I really do think it's, it's good news. Uh, baby steps. Because um, now, you know, when we, we're talking about misinformation and we're facing, you know, this blitzkrieg of people saying, you know, don't censor uh, freedom of expression, we can say, look, even Joe Rogan and Spotify recognize this is a problem. Even they recognize it. You know, your, your champions of freedom of expression are saying that this is a problem. Um, and I think it also invites us, invites an opportunity for us to say, look, Every platform curates. Every platform has rules. We're just talking about where you set the bar. We're talking about programming. We are not talking about censorship and freedom of expression and all those other sort of intuitively appealing ideas that you want to make this argument about. This is really about not enabling lies, not championing misinformation. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll take that glimmer of positivity. Um, <laughs> but, but on the more cynical front, um, he, he seems to be playing into this idea of balance, um, that somehow balancing out an idea that's wrong with an idea is right is our way out of this. And I, in, in our conversations about journalism broadly in the last decade, we've kind of moved beyond that productively. <laughs> that, that there is, you can cause harm through false balance. And... I wonder if the idea of like the weight of evidence in scientific discourse is actually better 
than balancing out bad with good? Or like, And how do we think about that as evidence as having weight on one side or the other? Yeah, it's an excellent, excellent point. And I, I totally agree with you. Uh, in fact, we have had a study that just came out, I'm going to say, you know, two weeks ago, where we did an analysis of, of how um, the Great Barrington Declaration and uh, this idea of natural herd immunity was represented. And the problem was it was represented with a lot of false balance, right? And as, as you've highlighted, um, false balance can do real harm. In fact, there's a really interesting literature, a lot of empirical studies that have shown that if you expose people to a false, falsely balanced um, version of the science, you can impact their perceptions and even their behavior. And they've done even some of this work in the context of vac intention to get vaccinated. Because what happens is it, it's, it becomes like this legitimate point of view that is just being contested by scientists when in fact what you really want to do as you, again you highlighted is use a weight of evidence approach and so that means saying look the in, the body of evidence the weight of evidence tells us that um there is no there should be no concern about vaccines causing infertility and those that suggest it causes infertility the science tells us are wrong and are on the fringes. But that's not how it's portrayed. If you have a, a false, falsely balanced perspective, you create this impression that uh, can be very detrimental. And I, I guess kind of the, the broader question I wanted to talk to you about, which is why now in this moment, at a time when science has arguably made its greatest contribution <laughs> <laughs> to to human flourishing of the past century, are we at a moment of peak questioning of science and politicization of science? Like, so I, I want to talk a little bit about that, but just broadly first, like, what do you make of that? Like, why now are we questioning science when it literally saved us from a pandemic? I, uh, holy cow! I mean, the vaccines were a freaking moon landing. I mean, it, it, I, I I don't think that can be said enough. Um, I, I, could, I just couldn't agree with you more. Um, you know, it, I've been, you know, studying vaccination hesitancy for a long time. And if we could get in, our, in a time machine and go back three years or was it two and a half years, I guess, and say that we're going two years, we're going to have a vaccine. I think we would have wished for or hoped for a vaccine that was 60% effective. We were. That was the rhetoric. We were saying, like, be careful what you wish for. It may only be 60% effective. But like, exactly. Yeah. And we ended up with these vaccines that, you know, in some situations were over 90% effective. You know, we really was a moon landing. In addition to that, we have this fantastic new uh, way of making vaccines that I think is, is going to benefit us in the future. Um, and the vaccines, again, they can't be said enough because we're starting to get a lot of revisionist history right now about the vaccines and about our public health measures. This can't be said enough. The vaccines have saved on planet Earth hundreds of thousands of lives. I mean, think about that, hundreds of thousands of lives. But despite all that, we are having these um, representations of science that are you know, questioning the value of science, questioning, um, and it's incredibly frustrating. And I think you've, in your question, you've, You've answered. I think it's what's happened is it's become all about ideology. And in fact, there was a you know fascinating study that came out just a couple of weeks ago, and there's been other studies that have, have shown this too. But there's almost a perfect correlation between three things. One, believing misinformation, being against the lockdown, and being on a particular uh, side of the ideological continuum. Um, they're all almost perfectly correlated. And we have to be really careful here because it is a correlation causation kind of analysis, but, but they are, there is an incredibly strong association between those three things. And yes, we're talking about the political right. And I think it's very important to have a, a, a caveat there. Not all conservatives, if you look in Canada, for example, most con conservatives support vaccination. Most conservatives understand the need for public health measures, but, at the same time, most of the individuals that hold these extreme views do fall on the political right. They do believe misinformation. And it's those individuals that are the most vocal against the, the lockdown. Can I play out a counterfactual for you with that one? I mean, so pre-COVID. Yeah, I know where you're going with this. I bet. <laughs> there was a fair amount of vaccine skepticism on the left, right? It was like New Agey, Northern California, uh, anti-Big Pharma. 
kind of narratives on the left. If Trump had won re-elect, had been reelected, would we have an alignment between conservative ideology and vaccine skepticism? Yeah, I, I, I thought that's where you were going to go. And as you can imagine, as someone who st- studies wellness woo, as I like to call it, I'm fascinated by this shift. Yeah. Um, it, it has been really, really, it's been very, very interesting. And I, and I think that that the alignment was happening before, before COVID. Um, Between libertarian ideologies and yeah, exactly okay. right. Yeah, exactly right. And and being anti-vax and 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 I think it's because increasingly the wellness community was was leveraging intuitively appealing concepts like choice and freedom and liberty and and also the understandable suspicion and frustration with big pharma uh, um, in quotes and and the conventional healthcare system. And I, and I think that you started to see those Venn diagrams overlap, so to speak, right? Um, but I think that the, um, what happened with the pandemic is that it, it accelerated that process. But it's, that suggests an ideological predisposition to be against these, which I, I agree was there with certain libertarian ideologies. I mean, what's more a sign of the big state than being told to put something in your body or whatever it might be, right? Like, I I, I kind of get that. But Trump represented a real political movement and capitalization on that. And I do wonder if he had been out there championing this thing as if he saved the world, which he would have done if he had been reelected. Um, would we have seen that political mobilization of anti-vax sentiments. Wow, what a what a fascinating question. Now, um would he first of all, let, let's just pretend Trump w- was going to do that because who knows. <laughs> you know what how, yeah, I don't what think we should he guess what he would have done yeah. <laughs> with with the vaccines. Um but um uh, fast forward to now because um we've seen Lindsey Graham and Donald Trump um support vaccines and get booed by his own community, by their own communities, right? So um, that demonstrates how powerful, once something becomes part of your ideological worldview, once it becomes part of your personal identity, even when your leader, even when dear leader tells you that, you know, get boosted, vaccines are good, you fought, you you experience cognitive <laughs> dissonance and, and don't know how to move, move forward. So had he advocated for it earlier, I think perhaps it wouldn't have been as in, entrenched. Ha- having said that, um, I was wrong about the degree to which, uh, even though I studied the anti-vaccine movement, and I've studied vaccination hesitancy for a long time, I'm surprised at the power and traction that the anti-vax community has gotten over the past two years. And, you know, I, I don't think they would have taken the gas off at all had Trump been been advocating for vaccines. I, I So I think that their rhetoric, for whatever reason, would have still played out and probably would have still played out with many of those same individuals in the same community. Would, would we still have that connection with QAnon? And I, it's a fascinating question. It really is. Or, or and I guess the, the correlate to that is to what degree is anti-vax politics a proxy for something else? And I, It is, for sure. I think it is. I think we're seeing that in Canada, right? Like, why do the truckers come to Ottawa under the banner of vaccine mandates? It's because it has this, like, cultural currency. But they're not doing it for vaccine mandates, right? They're, they're representing a whole other set of political beliefs. Yeah, it's a proxy war, for sure. For sure, you know, and because it's so arbitrary. I mean, uh... Uh, the U.S. has the same vaccine requirement. Other countries around the world have a similar vaccine requirement when you're crossing borders. This same community probably has very different views about wh- how to protect our borders in other contexts, right? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And you have to show your passport when you cross the borders. And clearly the federal government has the power to have these kinds of rules. So it is completely arbitrary. And for sure, it's a, a proxy war around the reach of government. And, and you look at what some of the leaders of these movements have been talking about, you know, the uh, the federal government's not legitimate and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, things that are cl- clearly completely disconnected from the mandates. And as you know, most of the mandate policies are actually provincial jurisdiction, not federal right. jurisdiction. Right. The other reality is that the place in which this debate is taking place, largely on social media and in our in our media, has also shifted pretty radically. Um, and that's the place in which this questioning of science is 
is occurring, frankly. And I, I wonder what you think about this sort of both demand and supply side problem of this, that it seems to me we're losing our signals of trust and that we, we've sort of flattened our ecosystem so that everything has the similar veneer of truth. And the incentives of that system are aligned towards mistrustful information, not trustful information. Like there's kind of two things going on there. And I wonder so when you're tracking this kind of misinformation or even just this broader questioning of science, how do you look at that ecosystem itself and the incentives within it and, and how we operate in it? Yeah, I, actually, this is going to be a big theme in my next book. People often ask me, where's, you know, how do we get to where we are right now? And the answer is almost a cliche. I mean, it's really your world. It, absolutely, social media has been the driver. Yes, other factors are relevant, friends and family. Uh, tr- you know, traditional news media hasn't been ideal. They haven't been terrible, but they, they haven't been ideal. It really is about social media. And you're right, our information ecosystem, the information uh, economy is really structured to promote polarization. It's structured to uh, promote um, even the spreading of misinformation. You've seen these studies, you know this. Um, lies travel faster than the truth. Um, more emotive content is more likely likely to spread. Um, so this is going to be one of the great challenges, I think, of our time, is figuring out how we can maintain this open discourse, because this is where conversations happen now, right? For better or worse, this is where conversations happen. This is where we get our information. Um, So we have to figure out how we can maintain that open discourse, but at the same time, make sure that there's quality information rises to the top. Um, It's not going to be easy. It really isn't going to be easy. We need um, science-informed strategies in order to counter misinformation and, and you know, so that is going to mean things like redirects, labels. Um, I actually think deplatforming. You know, a lot of people think, oh, let's be championing deplatforming. I don't. I think that that should be, you know, one of the very last tools that you ever use and only used in very clear circumstances. Um, this is going to be one of the, our, our great challenges going forward, and, and in part for the exact reason that you say, the economy of this space is what is is going to drive the, the chaos. And if you saw Roxanne Gay's essay in the New York Times last week, she put her finger on something really interesting, particularly about the Twitter discourse, and that it's not just that it's polarized, or it may or may not. I mean, as you know, there's a big debate about how polarized it actually is, whether echo chambers exist, all these kinds of things that people study. But it's more even epistemological. It's that... Mm-hmm. It's not meaningful engagement in any form of actual producing knowledge that's useful. It's reactive. It's fueled by anger or engagement. It, it, it's not a dialogue in any meaningful way, right at a time when we need to be having complicated dialogues, right? About like, what is science? Like, that's not an easy conversation. <laughs> and, and so how do you even begin to have these conversations in an ecosystem that's tailored for something so different, right? For reaction, for emotion, for fighting. I mean, cause it really does seem like that's the case here. Yeah, it's an, it's a fascinating question. And, and, you know, we're both active on, on social media and, and you can find yourself getting your, you know, I'm, I'm some, I study social media. We, I study Twitter interactions. I, um, I study the spread of misinformation and I find myself getting trapped by the the platform yeah. in my, and the way that I talk yeah. about things. And I'm sure you find the same the same thing. And and what you feel when you see it. I mean, it's just this <laughs> rush of emotion sometimes that you can just tell is tapping right into something. Or or that you use, you know, the less, you know, you, you could have used a, a better phrase, but you know that I've got this many characters and I want to get this out in a relatively quick manner. But at the same time, you've got to recognize that you don't want to, you know, feed the monster and, and you've got to figure out ways. So, for example, like we have this initiative called Hashtag Science Up First, um, where it's an initiative designed to counter misinformation on, on social media, on, on TikTok, on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter. And we have like rules of engagement, you know, always be positive. Always try to have diverse voices uh, in the mix. Make sure the content is shareable and accurate. 
Um, so we have these kind of rules of mm. engagement, and yeah. but but that that platform is a little bit different. I think the, maybe that what you and I do is where we're reacting to things. We're having these conversations where as that that initiative is more about posting things. Where I think it's easier to because you get that beat right before you post. Where um, yeah, so look, you can hear even my response. No, to I get you, it. Right? It's, it's a struggle. It's a struggle. It's a dance. I like to say that. Yeah. The other thing I kind of wonder is whether um, another thing we've seen over the course of the pandemic is that the scientific process itself has proven really hard to communicate to publics. And uh, in part, that seems to be because we've created such political urgency around the communication of science. And I want, and one thing you hear a lot is sort of the original sin of the way we talked about masks for example, them not being useful at first for general for the general public, um, when in reality it was actually a supply chain issue was the reason we were saying that. And it seems like that really did harm to the communication of science because it was a falsehood or a, a not literal scientific truth communicated in the name of something bigger, public health initiative or whatever it might be. How do you think about that? That sort of these political mandates, these public health initiatives and communicating science. Like sometimes those are in tension with each other, aren't they? They really are. And, and I think that this is something that we're going to learn from the pandemic going forward. I think this hopefully um, is going to be one of the legacies of the pandemic is a recognition that how we communicate about scientific uncertainty matters and can have an impact. And it may not matter next week or the week after, and you might have these short-term goals, but long-term, it's almost always a mistake to be dogmatic. It's almost always a mistake not to recognize the uncertainty and the evolving nature of the underlying evidence, the underlying science. Um, and I think the mask debate is a very good example of that, right? And, and I think there's other ones like the aer aerosol nature of the, of the spread. Um, and I think it's also a recognition of how important it is to bring the public along on that sort of scientific ride, saying, look, this is the best advice we can give right now based on the science available. And right now, so it's like February um, 2020, right now, it doesn't look like the evidence supports masks and there's scientifically plausible reasons we're worried about you touching your face. We're worried about uh, behavioral compensation. You know, thinking, I have a mask on. I don't have to wear other things. Um, for us to say that we don't want you wearing masks. But the evidence quickly evolved. And I, the other fascinating thing about the mask story, I think, is how the nature of the evidence can evolve. And um, it's not always going to be about clinical trials. It's not it, it, with masks. What happened is we got observational studies, then we started getting laboratory studies, and then we started getting sort of real life studies where we saw the differences between jurisdictions and that had masks and didn't, and institutions that had masks and didn't, and and, and this body of evidence started to emerge. And I think that that's another really important lesson. Always remember to explain the context, right? And the context is almost always about the body of evidence, the scientific consensus, which is messy and evolving. And, and the mass story is a, is a great example of that. And there's a, there's, there's a deeper tension here, though. I mean, it, right at a moment when we're striving for certainty and we're looking for absolute answers to things and we don't trust institutions the way we used to, you're saying on the flip side, you have to trust the messiness of science, and this is a long process, and that it's embedded with the very notion of uncertainty and and questioning and evolving. And like, how do we do this right now? Like, man, these things are at odds. Yeah, isn't isn't that true? And and there has been some fascinating research that's talked about how. Um, Basically, you you know, there you ask the the public, you know, do you want to hear about the scientific uncertainty? And they almost always say yes, right? And that and that isn't a surprise. If you ask people that if they want to know something, they almost always say yes. But what is interesting is there's also research that tells us, again, hard to study this well, but there is some evidence that tells us that telling people about uncertainty doesn't erode the trust, uh, which is good, right? Right? You know, it, it sounds like a very kind of underwhelming conclusion. But that is good news, right? That's so people want to hear about uncertainty. And if you tell them about it, 
their trust isn't going to erode. So my suggestion always is, you know, talk about the big picture truth. For example, vaccines work. There's no doubt about that, right? And then tell them about the scientific uncertainty and how that uncertainty is going to be resolved, hopefully. We're do- so we're doing research on this to find out, you know, how to fill in that gap and then why the recommendation that you have now is uh, is what has been suggested. And this, given, the, given this evidence, this is what we're going to do. It might change in the future, but this is what we recommend. Uh, the, science is always evolving, right? It's always evolving. And those who try to weaponize uncertainty try to create this false dichotomy that you were wrong in the past, so you're wrong now. On the contrary, changing your mind based on the science is a badge of honor. Well, and the entire incentive structure of the scientific process are designed to make people challenge orthodoxies and established scientific truths, right? I mean, that's kind of the point, is to evolve our knowledge and to challenge what we know. Yeah, absolutely. You know, people are watching science uh, unfold. And um, so they're seeing the retractions and they're seeing the arguments and, hey, that's science, right? It's messy. It's messy. Um, and that's that's one of the things I find frustrating about, you know, the, circling back to Joe Rogan and, and Spotify is this portrayal that they often try to create that that's not happening in science, that there's some kind of master narrative that is being controlled and and therefore this consensus that you're seeing is false. You know, oh my God, you know, when you're in it, it de- sure, you know, it feels like <laughs> scientists are arguing and that should give you more confidence about these big conclusions that are coming out, not, not less. And instead they use that as an example of the... The vulnerabilities and what the, the lack of knowledge, rather than a process that leads to more knowledge. Exactly right, and and they try they try to sort of weaponize that uncertainty to to create a distrust in these institutions. I find that master narrative thing particularly pernicious because you do see it pop up all over the place now, and it, it's the the antithesis to the scientific process, right? To to argue that there's some cabal of people making decisions in the absence of evidence is literally the opposite of a scientific process. It is. And in fact, within the scientific, you know, this is an area we've done, we've done research, the concern about a master narrative often emerges. So I want to be really careful what I mean by that. Uh, There are these checks and balances in place in, in the scientific community to avoid that from happening. So for example, when uh, big science happens. There's always this concern about, is this the bandwagon effect? Are people just jumping on stem cells, genomics, and um, be, because let, let's check ourselves to make sure that, you know, this isn't the bandwagon effect and that we really believe what's happening here. So there's always people scrutinizing and wor- within the scientific community worried about that happening or commercialization. You know, are we really excited about um, genetic testing because we think we can commercialize this? And Or is it because of it's funded, being funded by certain sectors that want it to happen, right? Yeah, so there, there's this constant evaluation within the scientific community about this concern about, I hate to use the word, the phrase master narrative, but the, these... The, Outside influences on the scientific process. And they're there. Yeah. Science is, is a is, you know, happens in, in society. It's a social phenomenon, right? And and the goal is to rec- always recognize that it's a social phenomenon, recognize that these biases exist, and do what you can to create frameworks that minimize those forces so we can nudge ourselves closer to an objective picture of what's going on. And, and at, the, at the core of that is, I guess, understanding healthy skepticism and questioning orthodoxies and separating that from efforts to undermine the system as a whole. And I, I wonder what you make of this kind of phenomena that I've been noticing a lot lately of um, medical doctors and doctors in particular, and people who study health sciences, for example, coming out and really challenging publicly sort of what we know about nutrition or the human body or our lifespan or... And, some of them are very credible academics and scientists, but there's a huge popular currency for this right now, it feels like. Like these people are becoming YouTube celebrities, for example. What's going on there? And is this just healthy questioning of process? Or are these people capitalizing on this desire for some alternative narrative here? I, I think it's all the above. You know, sometimes <laughs> I think that there is some interesting, you know, questioning going on. Um, but... Uh, 
often it's that there is a market for this contrarian point of view, right? That that feeds, especially if it feeds something that people want to hear. So let's say, um, and, and you see them coming, like the diet industry is a great example, right? right. Um, Which you know nothing about. <laughs> <laughs> and the funny thing with me, with because that's another area that I've, I've been following for for years and years and you know I've written about you would think that people would recognize that uh there's no magic diet. Right? Pete, you would think we've been promised a magic diet for decades and decades and decades and it never plays out. It just never plays out, right? Um but you know you'll often get these MDs or whoever you know emerging with they've got the answer and say you know it's all about fat it's all about protein or it's about intermittent fasting it's um uh and I think it being a contrarian I think can be fun I think that that honestly I believe that's part of it you know you get a lot of attention um it helps sell things um but I also think it, it when it speaks to a belief that people want you know, people want an easy answer. I think it gets traction and takes on a life of its own. We saw that with the gluten-free thing that really, you remember Wheat Belly? This contrarian doctor came out with Wheat Belly and it became the diet and it's lived on. I think that that's a really important thing to, to remember that these contrarian points of view may feel like they, they go away, but the, p- gluten-free is still a health halo now, right? Despite the fact there's no evidence to support that. Of course, you have celiac or non-celiac gluten sensitivity, but as a wellness food, it, it's that's a myth, right? But how are citizens to navigate that, though, right? Like, there is, we're asking a lot, it seems to me, of the consumers of information and the absorbers of information here. That surely there's some individual agency, clearly, but when you're being told radically competing things by different authorities or even institutions of authority, it's it's really difficult. It is, isn't it? And and I think what you can do is you can give people, and, and I try to do this myself, I, I look, it's an incredibly chaotic information environment. I totally get it. Totally get why people, I, I, I struggle. But there are tools that you can implement. We've already talked about one of them. Always remind yourself, what is the body of evidence in this space? Well, the body of evidence of dieting is it's hard. And uh, we know that eating healthy food is a good idea. I mean, there's pretty some pretty basic stuff. Always remind yourself what that body of evidence is. Take a step back. Always ask yourself, what kind of evidence is being used to support this claim? You know, is it just an anecdote? Is it just a small study? Like the hydroxychloroquine ivermectin story is a really good example of that. That entire myth was built on, you know, laboratory studies, small studies. And then we started doing the good research, the bigger clinical trials. We found out it wasn't true. Right. So always ask yourself. What kind of evidence is being used to support this? And then, of course, also ask yourself, who's saying this? And where do they reside in the broader public discussion about this topic? Yeah, I think that's wise guidance. I want to talk a little bit about some of the mechanisms we have to push back against this, the, particularly the the most pernicious of this disinformation problem. And it, and I, I take your point that deplatforming is should be reserved for pretty rare circumstances, um, we do know, however, that like in the political mis- disinformation space, deplatforming actually can work. I mean, taking Alex Jones off of YouTube decreased the impact of his particularly pernicious disinformation. Right? He still exists, clearly. He still is on other platforms. But him not being on the mainstream platforms where we're all consuming information and his ideas are being normalized made a big difference. With the medical disinformation space, where do you see that line, right? Where something is important questioning of ideas that should be tolerated as part of our discourse and the stuff that really is like dangerous in the middle of a pandemic and we maybe should be deplatforming. So there has been some very recent work that has suggested, again, that deplatforming does work. And by work, I mean decrease the traffic for whatever the information is, right? So... It is a strategy that can have an impact. Um, you know, the downside, of course, is maybe they're going to go to other platforms like Rumble, <laughs> and uh, it's just going to intensify the echo chamber and the polarization. But if you're just looking at it sort of in the aggregate, deplatforming can work. And I think that's true also with those who are pushing, you know, health and medical misinformation. I think that that's a tool that can be rolled out in extreme cases, especially if there are already defined rules beforehand and those rules have been 
been um, breached. Um, I, I also think with medical professionals, it, it's important to remember that they have different standards too. They have different obligations. They're, if you are a licensed medical professional, you have a responsibility to, to the public. You have um, ethical rules that you must follow. And you also have licensing boards, College of Physicians and Surgeons that can take action if you don't um, behave appropriately. And that's not censorship, right? That's holding you to your ethical legal obligations, not only to your patients, but to, to society. And um, colleges in uh, physicians and surgeons in Canada have recognized that and they've started to take action against some physicians. I would say they haven't done enough. <laughs> they haven't done enough, but I understand that, you know, there's processes that must be followed and there's resource issues here. But that's another tool that can be used. You know, colleges, physicians and surgeons who have as their legislated mandate, their obligation is to the best interest of the public, right? So they have, that's a tool that can be rolled out. I also think the platforms need to, to do more, whether you're talking about Twitter, um, you know, Instagram, Facebook, uh, TikTok, they need to do mm -hmm. more also. I mean, ironically, um, platforms get accused of censoring or breaching supposed First Amendment issues when they moderate. But First Amendment doesn't protect platforms. It protects governments from doing this. You're right. I, I get so frustrated. You know, there, we, all, we focus so much on uh, sort of scientific and health misinformation, but there's also kind of like, these, this rights misinformation that is totally. being deployed and, and doesn't get checked at all, yeah. right? I, I've even seen some very reputable people talk about the Joe Rogan um, uh, debacle and say it's freedom of expression versus public health. No, it's not. It's not freedom of expression versus public health. And by allowing that to that framing to win out, you're kind of letting the deniers get a win because you allow them to, to frame the debate that way. You're absolutely right. You know, any legal expert will tell you, you know, in Canada, for example, it's only government action. The charter of, uh, only applies to um, public actors. Uh, it's the same in the United States. Um, and it's not even the spirit of freedom of expression because, um, you know, you have someone, you, you work with a producer, <laughs> you have a, uh, a uh, there are radio stations and TV shows have programmers. Uh, newspapers have editors. You make content decisions all the time. I always joke that, you know, I haven't been on Tucker Carlson. <laughs> Is he censoring me? <laughs> no, he's making a programming decision, right? Um, so people make those decisions all the time. Yeah, just to come full circle on that Spotify and Rogan thing, I mean, nobody's really asking that for him to be pulled, I think, from other platforms if he was just publishing a podcast and then monetizing it through ad revenue as he was before. We're talking about it because... Spotify paid him $100 million for exclusivity. And, and I wonder just to what degree they've made their bed here. Um, I, I'm not sure how they get out of it, frankly. Yeah, it is, it is interesting. Um, yeah, uh, it's not about censorship. It's not about censorship. It's not, I can't say that enough. You'll say that, like, and then the very next line, it says, stop censoring people. Um, it really isn't about censorship. And I, I think that, um, you know, had Spotify come out Right after the the, uh, the you know we after we signed that letter and and said okay we're we're going to pull those episodes we're going to make sure that Joe Rogan um, doesn't spread misinformation or or frames things using a weight of evidence approach some of it might have ended you know it, yes it's 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 spun out a little bit differently right now I I don't know what Spotify does now you know they've invested a lot in this person. Um, they've invested a lot, even in the messaging around um, how they want their creators. What's the language they use? I can't remember. Yeah. To have freedom, I don't know what they what they do now. And it's interesting because they often I hate this phrase. I'm going to use it anyway. They they speak out of both sides of their mouths because in defending their actions, they say, "Look, we've removed." Didn't they say that we removed twenty thousand posts yeah. or something? Yeah, for breaching their medical misinformation policies or whatever. Yeah. So yeah. so you do do that. You're just not doing it here, right? So it, it kind of, it, it creates this weird tension for them because they've admitted that they will do that to cur curate their their product, but they're not doing it here, which is a very strange position. It's not conceptu conceptually coherent, really. Um, you're basically saying that you're okay with this content. I think a part of what a lot of people are really struggling with now is how do you have this conversation without further alienating people on a whole host of issues, including health information, 
but also politics, frankly. I mean, look at what's going on in Canada right now. I mean, we are in a very, very toxic public discourse about a whole host of things that in some ways are legitimate issues to be discussing. And I think of the health information debate and like it is totally reasonable to think that big pharma should be questioned due to their role in the opioid crisis, right? Like I think that's a horrible, horrible thing that they did and they should be blamed for it and not trusted because of it. And yet I also think we should trust vaccines that they developed, right? So how do we have these conversations at the same time as a, as a society, frankly, and not get torn apart here? So I'm always an optimistic person, you know, glass half full. I'm pretty pessimistic about this. I, I really, I really am. You're right. We could put, you know, there are so many things that we should be discussing. I think it is an interesting legal and rights question about when governments should have mandates and when they should, you know, pull them. That is an interesting question that I think we, it's reasonable to have. Um it is interesting questions about when we should close the schools and when how we should open them. And there's a complex benefits and risks that need to be weighed. I feel like we can't have those conversations anymore. It really has become phenomenally polarized and so much about, about ideology, in-group signaling. And when that happens, when that happens, I, I do think that, as we've seen in the United States, um, having sort of rational conversations becomes very, very difficult. Um, let's, you know, there is good news, right? There is good news. Okay, we, come on, bring, bring it around. <laughs> bring us <home> here. <laughs> I, I think we need to recognize that, you know, countering misinformation has worked, right? You know, a year, a year and a half ago, a huge percentage of, of Canadians and Americans were hesitant you know, had some degree of hesitancy. We narrowed that. We really, really did in both countries. Yes, there's far too many that are still hesitant and still believe misinformation, but we narrowed that. Trust in science, yes, has deteriorated, but it's still there. And, and even think about masks. You know, we went from zero compliance to, was it 90% in Canada and, and pretty reasonable amount in the, in the United States too. I, I, you know, as someone who follows behavior change literature, that doesn't happen very often, right? So we got to remember those good news things and we got to remember that fighting misinformation, you can make a difference. You really can. You can flood all the platforms with entertaining, engaging, meaningful content that can make a difference. Yeah. Thanks for everything you're doing to help that process. And it was great to talk to you about it. Thanks so much for having me on. That was my conversation with Tim Caulfield. As always, you can reach me at taylor at bigtechpodcast.com. Big Tech is presented by the Center for International Governance Innovation in association with Antica Productions. The show is produced by Trevor Hunsberger, Debbie Pacheco, and Mitchell Stewart with associate producer Abhi Raheja. Please consider subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We release new episodes on Thursdays every week.